So I'm obviously not going to talk about my own research, I'm going to talk about our experiences doing crowdsourcing data collection with children, but just to situate the problem space, just one tiny slide and what to tell you what's sort of motivated the, the work we're doing at the moment. And that's the idea that we actually, as a, a research community, know a lot about the early stages of learning to read. We know what kids are doing, we've got quite good uh, cognitive models of what kids are doing when they're first starting to read. And generations of cognitive psychology has taught us a lot about what we do when we read as skilled um, word recognisers and we've got lots of computational models and lots of good understanding from cognitive theory. But there's a real gap here in this transition from novice to expert and that's what my current research is trying to understand, how children become skilled word readers and skilled comprehenders. And it's this problem space that led me to do the online data collection for two reasons. One is that we need lots of participants, we need lots of children because we wanted to assess the um, processing of lots of words. If we have lots and lots of items, we therefore need lots and lots of subjects. And we're also doing a series of uh, short-term training experiments where we have to get kids back in to do our experiments day after day after day or week after week after week. And the sort of facilities that Jo talked about in her talk about emailing links and, and, and doing this sort of mini longitudinal studies is, is, is fantastic to think about in this platform, but not without challenges. Now, as a community of psycholinguistics, I think we've been pretty good at dealing with and thinking about data in big data terms for a long time. Uh, psycholinguists have long worked with dictionaries and with large language corpora. Uh, we know lots about words, you know, hundreds of years worth of dictionaries to tell us about words and frequencies and how words co-occur and so on. It's more recent though since we've started really embracing mega studies. So these are studies that combine studies of um, smaller sets of items and combine them together. So we get lots of information about the processing of items which can complement the dictionary lexical statistics type experiment. And then, of course, more recently with the internet, with crowdsourcing, MTurk and so on, we can also increase the number of participants to many, many, many uh, tens of thousands. And if we put all those things in interaction, we've got a fantastic set of tools to ask psycholinguistic questions that we weren't able to answer satisfactorily um, until fairly recently. And a nice example of that, anybody who's interested in this, would be something like the English Lexicon Project, which did uh, this sort of crowdsourcing of data collection on 40,000 items in the English language. And the data were all online, and you can run virtual experiments using the data set and so on. But that's skilled reading. Now, many of the things the Belota paper and other papers report on are lexical variables that have their, their roots in development. They're, they're lexical variables that emerge as a product of language and reading experience. Even frequency, you can think of that as emerging cumulatively over time. So we need to understand the developmental um, roots of this. So we need data from children. Now, there are children's dictionaries, there are ch children's frequency counts, where you can say, well, in grade book for grade four, um, what are the words that children are meant to know, what's the frequency of the words, and so on. But what we're really lacking um, are large-scale data from children themselves as they process and engage with, with, with words. Um, we need large N, we need broad sampling, we need the non-weird type population, as, uh, as uh, Andy referred to previously. I'm talking here about written language. There are, again, there's a long history of, of doing this quite well in spoken language and in the early years of acquisition. Many of you might know the Child S project, which is Brian McQuinney set up I don't, in the 1970s, which is a fabulous resource, and then the Word Bank more recently. So it's not that developmental data don't exist, but they're very much in the early stages of acquisition and they're not about reading, they're about mother-child interactions and uh, sort of baby lab type things. So this was our starting point. Our corpus that we've been working with certainly constitutes uh, big data. This is called the Oxford Children's Corpus. It's managed and hosted and held and developed by Oxford University Press. It's in two parts. Uh, there's the reading corpus, which is material that's been um, written for children, children's reading books, um, newspapers, curriculum materials and so on for kids. And that's currently at about 34 million words. The writing sample is currently at a massive 560 million words, 800,000 stories that have been written by children as part of the BBC Radio 2 500 words writing competition. So we have a lot of data about words that are written for children or are written by children. Um, so that's our sort of starting point from, from, from the corpus. So with having access to this amazing corpus, the promise is that we can then begin to do a sort of mega study type approach with 
uh, children to collect developmental data. So we can extract, and we've been extracting various different types of lexical statistics from the Oxford Children's Corpus, and then relating that to children's performance on various different tasks. Many of these are regular experiments where we're manipulating things with groups of kids in the, the way that all of us would recognise as experimental psychologists, but we're also uh, wanting to do this at scale for a number of different reasons. The work I'm going to talk about from now on is our first attempt at doing this at scale. It's work funded by Lee Hume Trust, very much um, led and directed by Yaling. Yaling, you need to wave because I have to leave soon, so any questions later on in the wave again, <laughs> this Yaling show here, uh, with Helen Norris and Megan Bird. And I must meet, mention Vinita and Ilangina, who are our colleagues in children's dictionaries at OUP, who make this work possible. Our task is really, really simple. Our experimental task is not simple, but the one that we're doing online at scale is very simple. It's a visual lexical decision um, experiment. So kids see a word and they just have to make a yes-no decision as to whether they know it's a word or not. In the final version, uh, or at least the current version of, of, of our online experiment, each child sees 48 items, 24 words and 24 foils. Um, we started off with 80 and then realised the completion rate was so low, people started the experiment and then quickly gave up. We reduced to 60, no good, and then we've reduced to 48 and that seems to be a good sweet spot and our overall completion at 48 items is 92%. So when we can get kids to do it, the completion is actually uh, pretty good. We're starting with an aim to get good data on 2,000 words, but given each child can only do um, 48, 24 words each, and we've got children of different ages, the consequence of this is we need a lot of children to get enough observations per item if we're aiming for 2,000 words. So we have a, a big challenge in terms of the amount of data that we need to collect. We have lots of challenges. We've had lots of challenges. We've mastered some, and we're still at the mercy of, of others. And I think my take-home message from, uh, from our experiences of doing this for the first time is that we completely underestimated the challenges ahead. It's harder, it's longer, and it's more expensive than I imagined when I wrote the grant proposal, which was right back uh, very, very early 2014. I think the world has moved a long way in, in this sort of area in the last four or five years. So I thought I'd just spend a few minutes just uh, talking about some of the challenges we faced and how we went about solving them, or at least trying to solve them. So one really starting point was thinking about the choice of platform. And when I look back at the grant proposal now, you know, this didn't feature in the grant proposal at all. I was so naive. I had no idea uh, what, uh, I knew what I wanted to do, but I had no idea. Thank goodness the reviewers were kind on this point. Um, so when we set out to do it, we considered the question of whether to use an app. There were people in our department using apps to look at various different questions. But for the reasons that were mentioned earlier, we decided against this, most, mostly that people would have to download something onto their, their phones or tablets, and we didn't want our participants to have to do that. Um, obviously, things like Qualtrics and so on were a non-starter in terms of having the experimental control that we, we, we need for our study, even though our study was quite simple. What we did for some time, and I, think I imagine starting when we started out, that we'd just build our own. And again, for the reasons talked about earlier, this was problematic in many different ways. Not particularly for the coding problems, because Yaling was, was uh, a, a, able to do that, but more to do with things like the server, the security, the compliances. The, I still don't know what a back end is, but many authorities <laughs> in the University of Oxford told me there were major problems with back ends. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I, it, it, and the, the solution at Oxford then is, but I've, you know, I've not met Andy before, and it tells you something about the fragmentation of uh, Oxford University, then an expert in my own department at the time who I didn't know was doing this stuff. It was very fragmented, and basically labs were you know, getting on and making their own solutions. But because of the compliance and because of the security and lack of knowledge of back-ends, um, this wasn't an option for us. But fortunately, a chance conversation with, with Jenny uh, introduced us to Gorilla and to Joe and colleagues, and that was how we ended up going. And this was enabled by one of Gorilla's uh, grant, postdoctoral grant things that, uh, that Yarling um, um, was successful for, and we had a lot of support from Gorilla to make this happen. So uh, 
a good thing but also a challenging thing was our need and desire to work with our colleagues in OUP, in Oxford University Press, and also with Infuse, who's the company of graphic designers and illustrators that OUP use. There were issues to do with this being slightly marketed in an OUP type way. It was going to be hosted on the OUP uh, server, not the data collection, but the partisan presentation site is hosted on OUP site. And there's a lot of work already done between OUP and Infuse that we had to interact with. But then a challenge was to take that interaction and that way of working and make it work in the gorilla type in, in environment, which obviously is fundamentally, um, at least at that time, was you know, core experimental psychology, adult participants doing quite you know, boring things, not lots of bells and whistles. We wanted lots of bells and whistles. So we made uh, with Infuse something that was quite full of bells and whistles. Um, I've spared you the, uh, the live version here because things are moving, there's noises going on, it's all meant to be quite um, entertaining because obviously children get exposed to lots of digital media and this, if we're going to try and get thousands of participants, it has to uh, appeal visually and so on. Um, again, so many challenges here that we underestimated at the start. We've got quite a large age span we want to collect data from, and so what might appeal to a six-year-old isn't going to appeal to a slightly um, you know, teenage-like 12-year-old. It has to look professional and competent for parents and teachers. So we had graphic designers to help us here from Infuse, but then things like we you know, merrily have the animations and the sounds, and then we were told quite last minute about the difficulties of that to do with accessibility and that some people might, might find the sounds and animations aversive so you need to be able to turn them off which is a fair point but then we had to pull back the experiment to turn to enable a turning off button I mean who would have thought of that at the start but we now have a little button where you can turn all that stuff off Another challenge which has been difficult to balance the, the pros and cons with along the way is what sort of um, platform to use in terms of desktop, iPad and phones and so on. And in the end we kept this open so we've got data from people using various different devices. With hindsight I think I'd probably reverse that decision and just go with laptops and, and, and desktops. iPods are really popular with kids but they're problematic at least our experiment's not been um, always smooth running there. We get delays when selecting the response. Kids tend to sort of tap away and get bored if it doesn't respond properly. And this issue with the animations was then a particular issue when using with iPads. And we found that there was more dropouts, there was more lack of completion on an iPad format. And of course, these down the line lead to problems with thinking, certainly thinking about RT when you've got these different devices going on. But as Nick mentioned earlier, it's possible to filter the data so we can at least analyse the data separately. And the data from laptops or desktops, we could potentially do some RT work with if we wanted. But our main variable at the moment is, is accuracy anyway. Now, onto the issue of working in schools. I mean, we're used to working in schools, but we're used to having us, you know, a person working in school and doing this sort of testing in school at scale uh, remotely uh, threw up very many challenges. So we talked about Matt's um, parents earlier. I mean, if you go into an average primary school, the state of the computers in there is pretty dire. I mean, it was quite a shock, actually, to, to see how impoverished some primary schools are. Um, with the lack of equipment, the equipment that's there is really old computers and ancient browsers, the like of which you haven't seen since about you know, 1998 or something. And of course, the things that we built don't work on the out-of-date browsers. So um, that was one set of issues. And then there was also issues with firewalls, so lots of security in schools to stop kids going on YouTube, Facebook, and so on. So what this meant is we had a lot of teething problems, and we were trying to do this in a rush against deadlines, which meant we hadn't done all the um, user acceptance testing well enough. So when we tried to roll out at scale, we were getting lots of issues with it not working. Um, and this took a lot of work from us, a lot of work from Gorilla, who were fantastic behind the scenes helping us. But it also required a motivated person in the school to download Chrome, to switch off whatever, to switch on whatever. So that sort of thing just made things difficult. Not insurmountable, but it still requires a person to, to do something. Um, ethics and consent, this is, this is a really, really big one. Um, obviously, opt-in consent at this scale is impossible, uh, and even our usual opt-out procedures were not possible to do for this sort of experiment. So if anybody's thinking of doing this with, with kids, I'd recommend um, starting your discussions with your ethics committee very early and um, involving them in the decision-making process. Choose my words carefully. Um, 
And I think for us, because it was a low risk experiment, because it was reading words, it's the sort of things that kids do in their classrooms anyway, non-identifiable data, no incentives, we, we were able, able to do it. But still, the constraints of ethics um, procedures and consenting has made it more difficult, both logistically for us to get it started, but also our opening screen it sort of asks questions that kids aren't very good at answering necessarily and this was to get around the issues of non-identifiable data we couldn't ask for birth date it has to be school year and and just complications along the way and this was very much a fudge and a compromise between us and and what ethics wanted us to do or wanted us not to do in terms of consenting because it was low risk and so on and because children would most likely be completing this either in the home or at school the ethics committee assumed that consent was sort of you know, some adult exposed the kids to this so therefore it was sort of okay to do so they were happy for us just to have a tick box there to say I know your my parent or teacher knows that I'm doing this so having got round the consenting issues and having something that was workable and so on the other big problem for us really has and continues to be um, issues with recruitment we're using prolific very beautifully and um, with our um, adult work but um, we're still to persuade Prolific to take on the task of recruiting children. That would be amazing. Uh, so we can't take advantages of the crowdsourcing platforms that you could if you were recruiting adults. Because of issues to do with ethics, we also weren't able to do any incentives. I'll talk a little bit more about incentives in just a moment before I finish. Our only incentive is a certificate, though if you get to the end, you get a certificate. These are proved quite popular. You can get them on eBay and so on. So. Um, <laughs> So the recruitment problem um, required much goodwill, a lot of help from a lot of people, um, our partners, Oxford University Press, social media and so on, and just a lot of effort. I mean, just some pictures of the sorts of things we've done to try and drum up participation. I should say we're still recruiting, we still need more children. Um, things on our website, we've got how-to guides for parents, how-to guides for children and so on to try and get the increase rate up. So finally then, in terms of um, compliance and completion, there's always the issue for this sort of work uh, of parents interfering in the background, and we, we can't do anything about that. We don't know what's going on in the homes in particular, and we just hope that we're going to have enough data that that'll sort of wash out. Um, completion's now quite good, so once you get through recruitment, our completion's quite satisfactory. And certainly what has been unfortunate is that we haven't been able to do the gamification type things that we wanted to do. We wanted kids to get scores and badges and you know, some sort of set of sense of competition and ethics just would not touch that at all. And understandably in a way, because you've got a five-year-old you know, and they get X number of words correct and then their parents are going to be concerned that they've done a test from Oxford University where they only get five out of 48 or something. And you know, Parents are competitive and share these things and you could see that it were very easily scale into problems which are, are best avoided I think but it meant that we couldn't have that sort of uh, competition that goes on on the other mega studies where people are trying to outwit their other people with a higher vocabulary score and so on. So to finish then, um, online data collection with children for us is working well on, a, on our small scale stuff really well and these are basically just online versions of our regular experiments. We get around consent in there because we can just consent in absolutely the normal way, send the link, do the link in school or whatever and that's working really well. At scale though, it's, it's still very much baby steps um, for crowdsourcing with children. Um, issues particularly to do with recruit, recruitment and consent, even for a really simple experiment. I think when we get around those problems, if you want to scale it up to see the sorts of experiments that we really want to do, then there will be issues about reliability and validity with children. Um, because they're just a little bit more um, uh, hopeless as, as participants. Um, and I think people will be maybe touching on some of these issues this afternoon. And also I have a reverse weird concern here that actually when we go into schools and run our experiments, we have a pretty non-weird sample. We go in, we test everybody. When we're doing this stuff online, we're not getting everybody. We're getting people whose parents and teachers are motivated to download Chrome and da 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 da, da you can imagine. So at some point we'll compare our data online and offline. But let me finish again by uh, thanking um, OEP and Cauldron and Infuse for making the work possible. And as I say, we're still recruiting. Please, please pass the link on. And any, any children, any age, any age, any country, any language, just get them to participate. Thank you.